Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ferris Makes Hardware. Uh, this is episode 34, if I can read numbers while adjusting my light at the same time. <laughs> uh, and I called it Floating Point for a couple reasons. So let's just get into it. Last week, um, we worked a bit on designing the vector unit that I've been thinking about for, for the Xenowing, uh, um, along with doing some docs for some other stuff. Full disclosure, I didn't do much <laughs> Whoops. Uh, since then. I had some family stuff this weekend. Although I actually did, maybe I should go over this really quick. Because I did make kind of a cool change. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, first of all, I added a cargo workspace for the Xenowing project, which should really help on build times uh, because dependencies, for example, the RTL crate in, in this repo is is used by a lot of the simulator tests um, used by those other projects. So now they should all be built in like one target directory. So that's really nice. That's actually a feature that I only found out about recently. I don't know when that was added to Rust, but maybe a long time ago. Who knows? I don't do a very good job of keeping up with that stuff anymore. Uh, and then... More importantly here, I actually removed one of the pipeline stages in the CPU. So I've been talking about um, how I want to pipeline the CPU. And if you look at the classic risk pipeline, which I'll pull up here, because this is indeed classic. Let's find find a good example of this. Yeah, so this is the Wikipedia article, which I always like to come back to about it. And it has a diagram. Let's see. I think this is the kind of diagram I'm looking for, but I don't want to have both parts. That's fine. We'll just look at this diagram. Uh, so I always I always liked this diagram. Again, ignore, ignore the bypass part and this other, like, drawing of the same pipe. But just these, these top five. So these are the typical stages that a risk instruction goes through in the classic pipeline. You have an instruction fetch, which is where you basically issue the, an instruction read to the instruction cache. Um, the next cycle, the, that issue comes back and you have the data and you do a small amount of decoding. Um, not much, but like enough to figure out which registers you're going to read, if any, um, and some basic stuff, basic stuff like that. And then you go into the execution stage, and this is where like everything goes through the ALU. This is where most expensive stuff happens. And then on the following stage, you might issue something to the data memory. And then on the write back stage, you'll get data back from the from the memory stage if that issue was a read. And then you also commit your state back to the register file and everything. So this, this is like the typical pipeline. But when I implemented this uh, for my... Uh, Risk Five CPU. I actually had to add another stage. So after instruction decode, uh, I piped it, piped back in the instruction that we get that was fetched into the register file. And initially, when I when I wrote the CPU, uh, the register, the kind of memory I used for register file was like asynchronous reads. Um, so instead of like issuing on one cycle and then it returns on the next cycle, you would issue and it would return the data within the same cycle. Um, unfortunately, the way I had also routed everything else, this ended up being a critical path in the design. So I added a wait state such that it would still issue within this cycle, but then it would add a, a register on the output of that so that on the there would be another stage here, which is basically just register wait and then execute and everything. Um, it turns out later I refactored things, and now I don't have to do that anymore because everything's a little more decoupled and everything. So I basically removed this register wait stage. Um, and since it didn't really do anything, this was really easy to remove. Uh, basically, the memories already have registers on the outputs, um, so I didn't. I basically got to remove these other registers, and I could just grab those off the read ports. Um, so that was like really trivial, but I think that's really nice because now all of the like diagrams that exist for this are going to apply to this CPU as well, with one caveat, which unfortunately wasn't visible in that diagram. Um, so let me try to find another one. Uh, maybe if I find MIPS pipeline, I think I'll find it. Let's see. And then we'll get back to floating point stuff. Oh, come on. I've got to find... Whoop! Here it is. 
This is from a homework assignment at Brown, apparently. <laughs> I love that about the internet. You find so many things. It's just like from universities and stuff. It's loading, and then hopefully we have what we need. Again, I only want like this one diagram from here. Here. Let's see if I zoom in if it has what I want. It does. Great. All right, so this is a larger version of the same kind of pipelining diagram. And what I like about this is that it colors in parts of this. And in particular, again, it, it tried to ignore these arrows. But if you look at, for example, the register read stage and the write back stage, you can see that these are both mentioned as just reg, um, even though this part's typically called uh, write back. I guess DM and IMM are instruction memory and data memory because it's, it's talking about when it reads and writes from those. So you see here, um, like the, the second half of this is colored in. And here, the first half of this is colored in. And if I'm looking at this, yeah, there's different ways you can interpret this. But typically, in, in the original literature, uh, this is supposed to be interpreted as if this write happens first before this read. And that matters when you actually pipeline the instructions. So in this case, you have an instruction that's been in flight for a few cycles, and then you have this one. Or actually, it's this one. This one's been in flight for a few cycles, and then you this one has been issued during the data um, data memory access here. So on the following cycle, this one needs to pull registers out after it's decoding the, that instruction, whereas this one is going to be writing the registers back to the register file. And if this happened to want to load a register that this one's writing, that actually works because if if you kind of envision that this is writing in like the first half of that cycle and this is reading in the second half, then your data dependency works out and you don't need to do anything additional. Um, now that's that. First of all, that's just like a mental model. Like it doesn't happen that the read happens in the first half and the and the or the write happens in the first half and the read happens in the second half of the cycle. It's really that if you have a simultaneous read and write, the read will return the new data. Well, it turns out in the kind of memory that I'm using, that's not the case. Um, so you basically would have the opposite color, the opposite side of these colored. So this that exact case would actually be um, a read after write hazard. So to fix that, we would need to actually ins uh, insert a bubble for this instruction. So it would actually hang on this stage and end up executing it here instead. Um, so this case would have worked out. Or actually, that case is worse, isn't it? In that case, it must be. But anyway, this 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 is talking about things like forwarding and things, other ways you can, you can fix that other than just stalling. But anyway, kind of interesting. Um, so there is going to be a slight difference to like the typical pipeline, but it's not much, definitely going to be manageable. But yeah, I did that this weekend just cause I, it was something I remembered and I thought about and that'll be fun. Eventually I still want to work towards pipelining the CPU properly, but again, we can't do that until we have caches. And while I want to work on that, I want to work on the vector unit more. So that's what we're doing. Um, so again, to pull up the, uh, diagram that we were working on last time. So I think I have this in the repo too. Zeno wing doc DPE. I called it DPE so far. Whoops, wrong file. There we go. Uh, for dot product engine. And whoops, there's. This is what. Whoops, man. I'm bad at window management today. Whatever. Uh, so this is this is where we ended up last last time. I didn't touch it since then. Um, basically was thinking about doing everything with integers and having a couple data memories and then some kind of instruction memory in a sequencer. Um, and that every cycle you'd be able to load into these A and B registers for these operands. And then like on the next cycle or whatever, I didn't draw. Well, I mean, the fact that these are registers, I guess makes it clear, but then on the following cycle after the load, um, these would be pushed through these multipliers and then go to this product register on the following cycle, you'd have this kind of reduction. Now, first of all, um, I didn't take into account in this diagram that there might actually have to be additional pipeline registers here, which is likely given that we're implementing this on FPGA, um, which would be fine. Overall, we would just end up with more pipeline latency, but the throughput would still be the same. We'd still be able to produce a dot product every cycle. <clears throat> but there are two crucial differences to this um, that I thought about throughout the week. Um, first of all, the architecture is actually not what I want. Um, so this, you take in two inputs and then produce one dot product every cycle. Um, note that those aren't, this isn't the same dot product as the inputs you took in again, cause of the pipelining, but, um, it would do like the multiplies and the accumulates 
and this like these horizontal sums all for you. Um, and there's there's reasons I want to do this, which I'll get into in a minute. Um, but I decided that's not what I want. But the other the other change I actually want to talk about first is that um, I want the whole thing instead of being integers, I want it to be floating point. And there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, um, to do fixed point math is definitely possible. I think we have more than enough precision for everything that we need to do. But typically when you're doing fixed point math, like where your point is tends to change. Uh, you might be able to get away with, in this case, if we're just transforming vertices and doing some basic lighting, you could probably just do like 16.16 .16 the whole way. But in my head, I think it makes a lot more sense because when you when you take like two 32-bit components of these vectors and you multiply them together, you're going to get a 64-bit product. And you're, you're like, if you use, you know, 16.16 .16 number by 16.16 .16 number, you'll get a 32.32-bit number. So you kind of have also shifted um, where the decimal point is in the product. Um, and then once you add, that's okay, as long as they all agree on what that uh, decimal point was, um, because they're adding everything in like the same magnitude. Um, and then you need to output this somehow. And as you can see here, I have a to-do, because I wanted to have some kind of like uh, barrel shifter so you could actually select which bits of those 64 that you actually wanted. Um, so if, if your output was going to be, again, 16.16, .16, you would just take the middle 32 bits. Uh, but maybe you wanted to do a different set of bits or something. So that was that was something that I thought I might want to do, but that, that gets kind of messy to have that extra shifter on there. Um, I need to encode that somehow, and it's going to add a lot of hardware. Um, another thing is I thought about doing like some kind of clamping or min and max, because if you're going to use this for lighting, uh, once you get this product, you want to... Um, to not include negative values, for example, if this dot product was like, you know, the normal dot, the light vector or something. Um, so I'd have to do this this clamp and min and max. And if, if you want to specify values for that, then they also have to match like the range that you're doing if you're doing like a certain fixed point math. And I also wanted to be able to mux on the inputs of this because if you're only going to feed like three component vectors into this, um, then sometimes since, since that, that fourth component is always still going to be added to the sum, you either need to disable that or you need to be able to pipe in specific values here. Um, and one of the problems is that if you want to say, okay, well, I'll add a path where I can always add a one. And then that just acts as like, if you have a value here that you want and you just want that to be passed through, uh, then you want this one to be like hard coded as one. And you don't necessarily want to lay out your memory that way as you're putting data into this. Um, Cause that's just like a waste of bandwidth. Um, so then you kind of want to have a path where you mux a one in here, but then actually the value of one means different things, um, depending on what your fixed point representation is. Uh, further, these 32 by 32 to 64 product multiplies are not going to be cheap. That's going to take a lot of hardware and it's probably going to be really timing sensitive. Um, so I'd imagine there'd be several pipeline registers here, at least a couple. So it's, it gets kind of messy actually to do this kind of unit as fixed point. And I'm thinking that from my from my perspective, as someone who also has to do the software for this thing, originally, I, w I wanted, you know, floating point, but I was just thinking that I would do fixed point because that would be easier. But the point that I'm getting at is that it's actually not that easy still. And there's a lot of messy details with that. And I think, you know, especially since this unit is just doing multiplies and adds. So why don't I do this in floating point? Because this is like, this is a rare case where you could do something like floating point in easy mode because you wouldn't have to generate any traps. You're doing, in particular, a multiply and then an add, and you could do these fused, right? Now, I'm hand-waving a bit because with this kind of dot product, I don't know if you could actually do that stuff fused, but I'm not sure. But thing, things like overflow and underflow, you could probably handle just by, like, dumping NANDs. You could probably select, like, a fixed rounding mode for all this. I mean, this is this is like a accelerator for a particular kind of workload. So those are decisions that we can just make. And then suddenly most of the things that make floating point really complicated aren't really so much of a problem anymore. So I think I'm going to do this as floating point. And just to show uh, an example of some of the software that I want to accelerate with this, I'm not sure I showed this last time because there's basically two workloads that I want this to accelerate. And one of them is the more obvious one, which is actual vertex transformation. And that's essentially just two matrix multiplies. Um, and if you have lighting in here, there's some extra dot products there. But then you can break down the matrix multiplies into dot products. And then you do additional dot products for the lighting. And then 
that's basically sufficient. So it's first of all, it's more convenient if I do this in floating point because all my test code is already floating point. So that'd be really nice. Um, but additionally, I want to support all of this triangle setup work as well, which at least the way I factored it now is a lot of dot products. Uh, so if I have some kind of floating point dot product engine with maybe a nice unit to convert those to fixed point, maybe I'll bake that in there. Um, things start looking really nice. And, and I think this unit would be really useful for doing this kind of workload. So that's kind of what I'm thinking is that I'm going to change all of this from fixed point to floating point. Um, so that's kind of the first major change. The second major change is that I want to change the architecture a bit. And I'm actually going to make a new diagram here uh, to kind of express that really quick rather than changing the other one, which I will also do eventually, but I don't know if I want to do that today. Uh, so here, maybe I can just, actually, maybe I will modify this because it's actually a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, maybe <laughs> I actually don't really know. I haven't really thought about how I'm going to communicate this next part. Um, but I'll, I'll just wing it like I always do anyway. So let's see. What is a dot product? <laughs> a dot product when you have like two vectors, uh, let's say you have like vector a and B. And maybe this is a good way to write this. Who knows? Who knows? All right, so here you have like A, B. Actually, let's do this. We can do Q, R, S, T. Uh, w. X, Y, Z, just to have some, some letters here. And then here we're going to do, this is a vector A, and then we have a vector B. And this is a dot product. Beautiful, I'm getting good at this. All right, so what's what does this mean? something, right? So we have a dot B. Uh, so what this means is actually really simple. You just take all of the components and you multiply them together. So you do this component wise, four different multiplies, and then you do some sum at the end to, to add all those components. So if I were to write this out, you would do Q W plus let's do this, make this wide Q W plus Rx plus Sy plus Tz, if you were to do this. And so this, this produces one element. Um, whereas here you had several, right? You have this kind of reduction thing happening. Oops, something like this. We can call this D for the result, or R. No, we have R here, D for the dot product. Right, you guys with me? Like this is relatively simple. And if you look at, for example, um, this is this is a dot product. Let's let's go farther. Let's see if I'm willing <laughs> to do a version of this that's an actual matrix multiply. At least a matrix vector multiply. That's really all I care about. So we're gonna call this V which I think is probably going to work. Copy our little dot product here. And let's say we had Now I know I'm getting sloppy with the symbols here. Um but let's say you're calculating this product. You have a 4 by 4 matrix um and a four component vector. And then how do you calculate this? Well, it turns out this is really easy. You go row wise. So this will actually, I'll give away something here. This produces a vector, which is your D in this case. And the way you, the way you figure out each of these 
is I'm going to color code a little here. You can think of each of these as corresponding to like different rows. You can see this works out really nicely visually in this case. So what you do is you actually take these four elements and you dot them with these four elements and that gives you this part of the product. And same thing with this. You take this row by this column and you get this, this part of the product. You take this row by this column, you get this part of the product and so on for the last one. So the point of this is that this, this operation breaks down really naturally into dot products, which is why I was thinking to do a dot product engine in the first place, right? Um, additionally, uh, it'd be nice if we also supported a special case, uh, which is basically this as well, right? Which we don't necessarily need to support, but this is also part of the workload or it can be, it can be basically an optimization because there's actually a lot of matrices that we do in, in graphics programming where we actually don't care about the last row or, or rather it's all constants. So you basically have zero, 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 one. Uh, so you can just not propagate anything. So that's pretty useful. Um, let's see. And then again, there was this other workload where it was just dot products like purely. So we didn't even have to break it down. So this is why I wanted to do a dot product, product engine. Yeah, exactly. Bordog first makes linear algebra. This is like really super, super basic linear algebra too. Um, which is why I know it. <laughs> um, yeah. So what I was thinking, uh, with this original kind of design, um, and the reason why I designed it this way with having the sums here is you can see very naturally how this maps to that. So again, if we look at this, this is this a register. This is the B register here. And then these four are the individual products here. And then these are the three sums, right? This add, this add, and this add, which I just do hierarchically. Uh, so you only have to do three of them, which, yeah. So this literally corresponds exactly to this, right? And then you have, you of course have this detail because this is fixed point that this doubles in width when you do these products, but that wouldn't happen in floating point. It could actually, you could actually do your accumulation in uh, higher precision before rounding down, which is probably what I'll end up doing, but, but we'll get there. Uh, and then this workload also maps really naturally to this because I decided somewhat arbitrarily that I was going to have four lanes here. Um, and that was, that was on purpose because again, if you look at this case, which is the most common one, um, you have four components here, four components here. And by the way, this is the, the right shape that you'd be working with, with this, uh, this kind of 3d graphics workload, this vertex transformation thing. Uh, so in this case, again, it's this vector by this. And so then here W goes here and this goes here, for example. And you actually would keep this B register fed with the same data for a few cycles. So if you want to, if you want to push this whole thing in the pipe, then on the first cycle, you put this in and this in on the second cycle, you put this in and this in and you know, third and fourth, and then some amount of cycles later, you have produced all of the individual components for this, this multiplication. And further, this, this kind of architecture works really well with this case, right? Because then here, uh, what you do is you put this in the same, same way you did here, you know, the first cycle, you put this row in second, third, fourth, you do, you know, first, second, and third. And then for the B register for all the cycles, you would put these three components in here and you would stick a one here. Uh, and, and so that's why I also added like a note to include a way to mux in some ones or for example, zeros here, but one is what you'd want in this case. So, and actually that would, that would be faster because here we could basically put all of the inputs for a single multiply in every four cycles. Whereas if we do this case, we would do it every three cycles. Um, so ideally like that makes a lot of sense and that sounds pretty good. There's a couple problems with this. One is that we need to be able to feed 128 bits of data into this all the time. And we would need to feed them. Like ideally these cases, you would have these vectors specified as three components. I'm I totally just realized I'm talking, I, I explained all that under my face, but I hope you can still see what I meant. Um, you want these organized in memory as just three components, not like a line to four. So then for this to work, you want to do these like strided axes where you're doing every uh, 96 bits rather than 128. And so you need whatever this read interface from these memories to be, you need that to support that kind of non-aligned access, which is not 
not ideal. Um, it's possible, definitely something we could do, but not ideal. Um, in addition to that, writing back isn't too bad because you basically are only just writing in 32 bits at the end um, because you're always just writing out a single component. Um, but then if we start looking at some of the other workloads, so for example, this part where we're doing all this triangle setup, all of these dot products, they only have uh, essentially two, three component vectors. And if we look at this again, this doesn't actually support three component vectors very well because you leave this last lane basically unused. So this is at least one flop that you lose per cycle, um, which is not great. I mean, it's fine. But then in addition to that, you, in order for this part of the, of the accumulate to work, you need to specify three here, three here. So again, you need those trident accesses. And then you need to be able to put zeros here, or at least a zero in one of them. So that's also why I wanted to be able to load zeros um, so that you wouldn't get utilization of this, but at least your your uh, everything would work out. Alternatively, of course, you could mux here. Mux is zero here. Like whatever, right? It, it doesn't really matter, but you don't get great utilization, but it's still usable. But actually, I think what happens is that because there's so many of these dot products and not as much of these, um, there's still a lot of these, then I think a solution that could better support this part of the workload as well as this one is more important than these two, if that makes sense. So there's another way that you can do these dot products, right? Here, you, you would it's literally a pipeline for calculating a dot product with a given number of, comp of components. But another way you can do it and I'll, maybe I'll just make a mess here. That's probably fine. Uh, if we just get rid of a bunch of this stuff, instead of having, you know, one dot product pipe, instead what we can do is we can actually have four separate multiply accumulate pipes. Uh, so it would basically look like this. And then these would have little arrows here with some optional reset. This is getting a little messy here. <laughs> it's super ugly how I, how I just ended up doing this, but I guess you can kind of get the idea that this will tap out um, or like it'll take the output of this and it would split it out such that you could get, uh, let's do this for example. Like that, and then I think we can do something like that. And then we can do something like this, like something like that. <laughs> I guess that works. Um, the point being that you, you tap off the output here and you feed it back to the input. So you're always accumulating here or resetting to zero. You need some kind of reset here too. Um, and this actually has a few advantages. So first of all, it's more expensive hardware wise, or maybe in floating point, I'm not actually sure, but it should be more expensive hardware wise because you actually add one more adder. The other architecture only had three adders in this part of the path. Um, but a lot of things here actually get simplified. So first of all, that breaks this out into, like instead of piping one dot product through this, the way this actually works is you actually pipeline four dot products at once. And if you work out the math, if you're doing these this kind of workload, the first architecture I had, you pass in you know 128 bits plus 128 bits and you get one out. So every, uh, if you were to finish this whole calculation, then since if you have the whole thing like completely saturated, then every four cycles or every cycle, you get one dot product out. So every four cycles, you get a result, an entire result vector. So essentially four components every four cycles, right? That's fine. It turns out with this architecture, you can actually do the same thing because if you did it like this, where let's say you took w and you broadcast it to each one of these so www w. then on the first cycle you would pass in this column and on the second cycle you'd get this column and the third you get this column and then the fourth you get this column 
And after that fourth cycle, you would produce these four results all at once. So with the first one, the, the first implementation, it's like you get this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, and that cycle repeats every four cycles. With this, you get every like three idle cycles and then bang, you have four, four products. So the throughput is actually the same for this part of the workload, right? And that's kind of interesting. Um, now the next part is that this kind of workload actually is slightly worse then. So instead of doing this in three cycles, um, because now this is like column oriented when you're reading from this, there are four columns in the matrix. So what you would do is on the first cycle, you know, you'd broadcast W to, um, you know, three of these and you would load this in the first and with some dummy data and the second, the third and the fourth cycle, the every four cycles, you get three products. So in this, in this workload, it, it doesn't perform as well. You don't get as much bandwidth, but it would still work. And then in this case, you don't have to have special handling to pipe in, you know, ones or zeros. You would just ignore the output of this, of this pipe. Now there are actually better ways to saturate this because if, if you were looking at, you know, producing one of these products individually, then yeah, you get worse throughput, but there's another way to look at this, which is what if instead you flip this on its, on its side, basically. So instead of calculating this, then this, then this, then this, you would try to take this vector. Uh, maybe it's not possible the way I'm thinking. I feel like it is if we, if we swap it, but basically the idea is, is to look at the fact that your workload actually isn't just this one. It's actually, you're doing a few of these, uh, right. You're, you're multiplying this matrix by several vectors and getting several products overall. And so what you can do is you can actually have basically four of these in flight at once. So you increase the latency for one answer, but then you keep the entire pipeline saturated the whole time. So ideally you should be able to produce all of your answers in fewer cycles. I think, I think that works out actually. Let's do some thinking about that. Um, I know this isn't the most organized, like most of my streams, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure this makes sense. Because again, the way this works out is you take, uh, let's see. So one of these is again, it's the row by this, right? So it's this times this plus this times this plus this times this plus this times one is the way you would do that. Yeah, so that works, right? Because you do, yeah, this and this, this and this, this and this, this and one. And whoops, I need to make that arrow. And if at the same time, you know, you had this and this on another pipe, you had this and this in another one of these lanes. So instead of broadcasting, you know, W to all four in the B register, you basically broadcast this, this element to all four here because you're multiplying all these vectors by the same matrix. Right. Does that make sense? So I think, I think in total, you're actually able to saturate this whole thing and it should actually be better utilization. So instead of, you know, producing one of these every three cycles, basically you're getting one or four of these every four cycles. I would need to do some math to make sure that that actually works out better. But my gut feeling is that it does because we have essentially more compute. So as long as we're able to, to keep this fed, I think it works out in total. Again, assuming you have lots of vectors, uh, in order to saturate this, which we will, that's kind of the point. Um, so it should actually work really well for this workload. And by the same token, uh, these can also be accelerated that way. Um, so for things like this, you take this W that you broadcast basically to all the lanes and you multiply by these, for example, then you would do this one and this one. So in a few cycles, like in this case, because you only have three component vectors, then every three cycles, you can figure out one of these, um, one of these outputs. And then again, you can pipeline those together. So you would basically be able to complete this whole workload here, this, you know, four multiplies, actually 12 multiplies, uh, and eight adds. You basically do this in, um, I mean, if you keep, if you kept everything pipeline, I'm, I'm ignoring latency here, uh, but you'd be able to do those 
all in parallel. So you basically have that done in three cycles or something. Every three cycles you could produce one of those. I think it, it works out to be. Because you feed, you know, all of these, then all of these, then all of these. And that works well. And it also has this other benefit, actually, that you can you can also you can actually map larger matrix multiplies onto this. Whereas in the other architecture, you, I guess you can too, but it's not as straightforward. Um, so I think this is going to be nice, right? I equip the transpose vector multiply of plus 33% through, but yeah, I think it works out that way. It should, it should be better in total for basically the hardware cost of one multiply. And there's, there's another reason this is kind of nice. So both of these fit a different pattern, right? So instead of loading 128 bits and 128 bits, you, you actually want to load four, like you basically want to do a gather of four 32 bit quantities into one register. And then you want to broadcast a, f a fifth 32 bit quantity across all lanes of the other register. And then you're always also outputting 32 bits and it doesn't, maybe that doesn't sound so nice, but looked at looking at it another way uh let's just remove some extra stuff here i'm gonna have to redo this diagram at least parts of it later anyway so i'm just gonna make a mess and not care so let's say we had basically five of these um and in fact we don't they, these don't even need to be necessarily symmetrical so let's say you had four of these that were i don't know like 1k for example you could basically partition your entire workload across all of these memories and what you could do is for this vector, which you need four of these, you would have a read from each one of these every cycle. And on the output, you could have a write to each one of these every cycle, right? So if you, if you partitioned your, your vectors into, you know, four different blocks at a high level, you'd be reading a component of each block on the input every cycle, and you'd be writing an output component for each block every cycle. And then all you need is for this B register where you're going to broadcast, you, I don't know, I can call this B mem, for example, for, in fact, these could be A mem, if that makes sense. A mem, that's great. A mem and B mem. And so the, again, the B mem would also read a 32 bit quantity. And this could be read only for the pipe, for example. So then you actually only have, instead of, you know, 128 here, you basically have 32 here. And then you might, you know, lock these to individual lanes. So instead of being up here, it probably makes more sense uh, that they would be here. And then you end up with a lot less muxing, right? Because you have, um, you know, different like read pointers for each one of these. But overall, you have, you know, 32 bits with everywhere. And all the muxing and everything gets a lot simpler. So I actually think this is a way better design. I think it's going to be a lot, um, a lot simpler in hardware. I mean, there is one big complication that I'm adding, which is that it's going to be a uh, floating point, but I think that that's going to actually not be that bad considering all we're doing is, um, multiply accumulates. Um, so I think, I think this is a really good idea and I think this should map to the hardware better. I think all the bit widths and everything here will work out better. Um, it, it seems a little weird because you have like this little asymmetry where like, uh, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned that, but like this memory could be a lot smaller, for example, because if this is basically only going to hold matrices in the common case or a few vectors, whereas these are going to hold the actual like, um, vector workloads, um, inputs and outputs, which should be handled by the programmer. Um, yeah, it all kind of, all kind of works out. You, you add a few registers for, um, indexing some more of these and maybe the instructions get wider to know like when you would read those and manipulate those registers. But I was going to thinking about doing this kind of like VLIV architecture anyway. So yeah. And again, the other thing is, is you can pipe crap in here, right? For the parts you don't care about, um, because the outputs aren't always going to be part of the, the, the output, if that makes sense. Because before we had these horizontal sums that mean all of these had to be included, all these products, but you can actually just ignore them if you don't want them. So I think ultimately this is going to be a simpler unit. Um, even though it got kind of weird, <laughs> but yeah. So that's a lot of thoughts just dumped on you guys. <laughs> By the way, hi Alcama. Thanks for the sub. I appreciate that. 
So yeah, I want to do it this way where you have these four parallel multiply accumulates, um, which is actually what I thought about at first when I was designing the dot product thing. And then I went with that other design thinking that it would just give in, um, you know, these two workloads, that would be a better design. Um, but after considering everything and especially feeding the beast, I think this is ultimately going to be simpler because like all these can be mapped into like a contiguous region of, um, of uh, MMIO like address space. And this could be like above that, for example, or maybe it's below. And you basically DMA into essentially all these at once or even just like four small chunks would be fine. Um, and then have the thing go and read the results back from this. So I think, I don't know, I think this would work really well. And I think for basically every workload here, it's all parallelizable, right? If you can, you can produce, you can work on multiple vectors at the same time uh, or multiple vertices at the same time when you're doing that phase. And then when you do triangle assembly, maybe there's like an assembly phase that does like the assembly and calculating the area of the triangles, but then we'll cull a lot of the other ones. And then it might upload um, some vertex information and stuff to the unit again to do primitive assembly or like, I guess af after you would have done assembly, but then you triangle setup, then you can also go back to this unit um, and be processing basically a bunch of triangles in parallel. Um, I think it should all work out. So anyway, I think I think this is a really good way to do this. And if I'm wrong, then who cares? <laughs> I want to build this. So I think I think that'll be fun. And then you don't actually have any muxes here anymore either because these always would feed back into the A memory and this always feeds into the B memory. And then all these A memories go to the A register, all the Bs, or all this B memory only broadcasts the B re uh, register. It, sh it should be cool. I mean, there's no definite right answer here anyway. It's just, what do I feel like, right? <laughs> I feel like, I feel like this is what I want. So yeah, uh, a really important part about this, I need to figure out how to do floating point multiplies and adds. <laughs> uh, I have I have a relatively straightforward uh, idea of this in my head, but um, I've never written it in software. So that's what I started yesterday. Uh, so in the, let's see, in the Xenowing organization, I think is where I put it. Yeah. I added this softy repo. Ooh, I can customize these. Can I do this? Yeah. They can all be pinned. Uh, so what this is, is this is this repo called softy and all, all it is, is just a, a, like a playground for doing this soft load stuff. Um, and I didn't get very far with it yet. As you can see here, um, I have a few tests, but I think what I decided, and again, this might be wrong. Um, but I decided I was going to take like the format of the floating point operations. Like that would be separate from the, uh, from the actual work that's done on them. Cause we, we actually have a couple funky things here that we can do. So for example, with these products, um, these widths are all wrong, so I'm just going to remove them. Um, even, even if you do this in floating point, you can, for example, not do the rounding yet here, or you could round them to like some higher precision immediate. Um, that's really common if you do like mixed precision stuff, like you might have these all be, you know, 16 bit like halves. And then by the time you do the multiplies, you accumulate in 32 bit precision. I think probably to make this easier on myself, I might just do, you know, 32 bit the whole way. Um, instead of trying to like figure out, you know, higher precision here or there or whatever. Um, but I want this library, like this playground to be able to handle multiple floating point formats. And for this application, that may not be very important. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I think that it's not important. Um, but I'm, I may want to, um, design other hardware projects where I would like to be able to prototype, um, operations within this kind of framework. 
for example, if I want to do half floats or something or some weird 8-bit format, if I ever feel like making a machine learning accelerator. Uh, hint, hint. And then this design could actually be useful for that too. But anyway. Um, let's see. I'm getting a little distracted by these diagrams, actually. For fun. I don't know what FPA, FP8 is. I, I think there's a few versions of it floating around. I think there's like a B float 8. No. Yeah, there is. Oh, no, that's actually something else. Yeah, the thing is, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. That would be uh, like meta program, uh, meta parameters to experiment with. I think that'd be fun. Yeah, we don't need those mixes anymore. So I'm getting a little lost in thought here, but I'm not really thinking about anything. So <laughs> this is me staring at this diagram and being useless. I removed all that other stuff to like the memory interface here and stuff, which all is just bus things that I want to bring back, but whatever. Yeah, I'm sure there's an application area for that two curves. And I'm sure with the with the state of machine learning today, if you if you can run run a real model on that even with just inference and show that it's really low power, you've got at least a good paper on your hands. add something here. Yeah, for lighting you want like min and max and clamp and stuff. Yeah, also this works this kind of broadcast thing works really well for lighting as long as you have a path to right back to this. Which maybe I want to add. Cuz if you, if you have like the lighting for a given vector, you can calculate its uh red, green and blue components um by broadcasting the light here and then having the components here. So you can scale a vector like this too with this kind of broadcast thing. Yeah, you totally could. Two curves.
But yeah, floating point. <laughs> All I got is this far, where I, I specified a format with a number of exponent bits, a number of significant bit, significant bits. And I, I normally call this the mantissa, just that's always what I've called it. Um, but I'm calling it significant because that's what it's called in a lot of like the IEEE specs, for example. Uh, now, there, the latest IEEE, I believe there's three versions. There's the original from 85, there's the revised version from 2008, and there's a new revised version from last year, actually. And there won't be another one for like nine more years. Um, and the improvements are mostly incremental. Um, I think if you just Google, you can find the 2008 version. Um, but I don't think you're supposed to... Um, I don't think you're supposed to distribute that. And it seems that the 2019 one is behind a paywall. So I'm kind of just piecing together things from a lot of different sources because I don't want to pay for that. Um, and, oh, by the way, uh, kind of an important thing. If you guys don't know Agner Fogg, you should. Um, does a lot of, has for a long time done a lot of work. Uh, and especially like nice papers and opinion pieces about optimization for, for CPUs. Um, and actually an important thing that he has here that he talked about when the new standard came out is some of the problems that remain. Uh, and he also has this, uh, this paper about exception tracking and NAND propagation. And his point here, if I were to summarize, um, is basically just that like traps really suck, especially if you're doing something like a vector unit, because you don't want to do like, like, let's say you had four NANDs going in and each of those cause some kind of trap in each lane. How do you handle that? Like most most SIMD hardware just doesn't or handles it in some way where it's like you'll get an exception for one of the components or something. Like it's it's a mess. Um, but you can use these like quiet NANDs and signaling NANDs to propagate some of that error information. And as long as like your binary operations do some kind of defined thing where like if you took two kind of signaling NANDs and like had to add them together, you'd want one of those to take precedence and you don't necessarily know it's one but as long as like those things are relatively well defined then you maintain like a reasonable amount of um error checking at the end of the computation while keeping the, the computation itself really fast and this is actually especially important for like out of order cpus because um out of order machines they actually can't like they're gonna queue up a bunch of work and speculatively execute a bunch of stuff but if one of those floating point multiplies uh, like, let's say you had some integer work and some, some floating point work. And the floating point work was before the integer work, but it but it was your dependencies worked out such that the floating point work could actually happen, you know, before the integer work, and it could happen in parallel. You could speculatively execute all that and buffer up all of the things that you would, all the state you would commit back, but you can't actually commit any of that state until you absolutely are sure that that floating point operation didn't cause an exception. And that's that's really shitty because that really limits uh, your throughput for out of order work just because of exceptions. Whereas if they could produce some kind of NAN or signaling NAN, then that's just an output to register like any other output that you would have, right? So with out of order CPUs, that would be a lot better. And same with like the error flags that are present in a lot of these units, uh, they, they behave in a similar way because it's like some global state um, that depends on earlier instructions. So it doesn't really work with a lot of that stuff. So basically with out of order and or SIMD, those are, that's kind of a bad way to do it. Now, the nice thing is, is that I'm implementing my own thing and I can make my own rules, whatever. And then for like compatibility and predictability, I want to match these specs as much as possible. But these are the kind of things where I can just be like, you know what? I like this better, where I don't have to do traps. I don't have to do any of the weirder stuff. I can instead just basically use signaling NANDs for everything. So I, I like that he has a paper about that. I like, um, I think I agree mostly with his opinions coming from like this hardware focused uh, perspective and also seeing that a lot of accelerators are, are built this way. You'll, you'll see things like based on IEEE 754 um, where some things are changed and maybe you have like a single rounding mode and things like that, which, which is fine for the kind of computation that uh, a given accelerator might do. And of course these, these things, aren't absolutes like for certain workloads you definitely don't want this kind of behavior but um for high performance data parallel workloads you probably want some kind of error mechanism that that works with out of order execution or at least simd which is what we're doing here because there's there's no out of order stuff in my core but anyway i think it's interesting 
yeah, exactly. Two curves. Just do your job right. It's fine. Yeah, Grotev. I can't help you with that. I can only make your situation a lot worse. <laughs> Sounding like you're the common, the common, uh, the common variable here. So I blame you. Bl I blame you for showing up to both of these things. <laughs> but yeah, this was, I'm getting distracted by here, but yeah, this is just a, a list of things I might want to accelerate with this unit. And I think we satisfy all of these basically. Maybe binning, maybe clipping and stuff. You could do a lot of this in parallel, I guess, but. I don't know how much conditional execution I'll end up with in this in this kind of pipe or comparisons or anything. I don't think I'll end up with any. I think this is basically just going to be this like multiply accumulate unit, um, and everything else you would have to do on the CPU. I think that's what I'll end up doing. Like it's really funny because when I set out to do this project, like some of the goals were so much less ambitious than what the project is now. Uh, like I thought that I was going to have like a PS one level GPU where it just draws triangles. It's all immediate mode no blending, no texture filtering, um, basically no acceleration for any of the workloads. So it would basically do everything with soft floats on, on like the most basic integer CPU with no pipelining, uh, no caches. And so many of those decisions, once I got there to like input the hardware, I kind of just thought like, man, I want this to kind of perform better. I think it's more fun if I try to make it perform better and try to design a solution. And I've totally fallen down this rabbit hole of like designing accelerator for this part, um, a pipeline CPU, all this kind of stuff. Hardware hexagon rasterizer. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> I think you could do n-gons without too much work, actually. Because, like, for example, this rasterizer um, has, you know, the three edge functions for a triangle, but you could, in theory, add more of those. I have no idea how things like interpolation of, of different coordinates would work on there. Um, <laughs> that might end up being kind of crazy. But for flat-shaded polygons, flat-shaded convex or concave i don't remember which ones convex i think polygons i think that's relatively easy <laughs> there's a reason why everything's triangles it's a much simpler shape to deal with but yeah anyway i guess that's my point is like once i got into this stuff i actually just enjoyed it <laughs> so i think i'm having a lot more fun with the project but at the same time it's taking so long because I'm tackling all these different things. Um, and it feels a bit overwhelming, admittedly, because this is a... Hardware takes a long time, and it takes a lot of design work um, for something that... Like, if I were to write this in software, like a simulator for this, this would not be very... This wouldn't take me terribly long. And in fact, I will do that, right? Not necessarily right now, but um, for, like, prototyping, I will do that, and I will hook it up to this exact code. Uh, where is it? this one this exact code like i'm actually gonna partition the work in that unit and run in this unit and emulate it and that's how i'm gonna test it um which will be fun but before we do that we need to figure out how these multiplies work and before we do that i have to learn to focus on the stream so that may never happen <laughs> just an hour of me talking But yeah, so I just, all I've written so far is this format struct with these number of uh, exponent insignificant bits. And the other thing, let's see, Wikipedia floating points. So let's see. Yeah, I want this kind of diagram. So some, some important things here. This sig bits here, I think, is these bits inclusive. So this would be 23 bits. But actually, an important thing about IEEE floats is that there's actually another bit. I think it's called in the hidden bit, uh, which is basically that there's always an assumed one here before the decimal point. So this is always one dot whatever this number is. In this case, 1.5625 raised by 2 to this exponent uh, after the exponent has been biased. Which, by the way, that might be something I'm missing in this structure, is is that uh, exponent bias. It's I think if I look up a lot of these floating points, the bias is going to be a function of the exponent bits. I think it's basically 2 or 
let's see. Two to the number of exponent bits minus one. Uh, minus one. I think that's what the formula is for the bias. I need to double check that because that, that is what you'd get for this, right? If you have eight exponent bits, then two to eight minus one is to the seventh, which is 128, and then minus one, and you get 127. Is the case for half two? So in this case, if the exponent has five bits, then I would expect 15 to be the bias, and it is. And double be two to the 10th, yeah, 1023. Yeah, so that actually always holds, which is great. So then I won't worry about that. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so I'm, I'm making a lot of uh, assumptions here still that are not necessarily codified, like the fact that there's always going to be a hidden bit. Maybe I want to document this stuff, but always going to be a hidden bit, and then there's the exponent bias is always um, based on the number of exponent bits. And so then you have things like the uh, the number of exponent bits. I think I have checks here somewhere. No, I didn't add checks for if these are too small which I probably should do. Not that it really matters, but if I want to use this as like a test bed for different things later, I probably want to do that. But yeah, the significant, I think you need um, maybe zero bits, actually. Because <laughs> I think if you, if you have these these biased exponents... I think you might always need two bits for that formula to make sense, which I'll probably enforce. Yeah, I'll just do that. And if I'm wrong, I can go fix it later. It's fine. So let's see here, because of format. Must have at least two exponent bits so if we do for example one and then some valid value here we're gonna have a couple of these because they're gonna panic but basically zero and one And these should fail, I think. Yeah, so this, this is kind of important. Uh, when getting my head around a lot of this kind of stuff, this kind of test-driven approach, I think, can really help. Um, just just to make sure I have like a lot of assumptions verified. And I think for the, the actual numbers, I'm going to have the numbers actually... Uh, like I think it's going to basically be this like struct value, and it's going to have a format field, which is going to be entire format struct. And then when you're going to do an operation on these, the first thing you do is you check that these are equal. So I might have some tests to make sure that that'll work. But that, that of course, bloats the this value in memory because you can see, like, whereas a normal float 32 would be 32 bits, this is now 48 bits. Um, but I don't care for this kind of testing thing. The The point here is, is flexibility and clarity um, and the fact that it's going to, like, be a test bed and I don't really care about performance so much with this. And then ideally, once I figure out like how these pipelines will work, then I can put these kind of things into hardware and ideally maybe reuse or at least port some of the testing effort that I'm going to do for this over to whatever I'm going to use to test the, the hardware implementations. And then something like this becomes okay, whatever my multiply implementation was, plus a register, plus whatever my um, add stuff was. Or maybe I'll do this as like a fused multiply add each step. I'm not really sure. Those are the things that I need to think about. Um, but again, I can think about them in software first <laughs> um, and then implement them in hardware. And then, of course, like the delay of this core is also going to depend on how well I can map it to the actual FPGA fabric. 
especially when when you're dealing with like multiplies um you suddenly might have to pipeline a lot uh so the latency here is not known to me until i actually try to map it to the hardware um and can ensure that it meets timing and everything which is fine this is that's normal um but then I, I can't really have test software for this, for like the sequencer, until I figure out what that latency is going to be. That's another thing. So it's going to be a bit of like back and forth and iteration on this thing, but I think that'll be good. So then then I think, uh, again, getting more distracted, I think like the whole story, uh, like the system level perspective, I think there's just going to be the fixed function rasterizer and this unit. And I don't think there are going to be any other accelerators to run this workload. Um, I think everything else is going to be done on the CPU and the CPU is also going to handle a lot of this DMA for audio. That's going to be a completely separate unit with DMA access to the system bus as well. So I think that'll mostly just like stream samples. Um, maybe I'll do something more fun. I'm not sure, but that's like a separate problem, but I think this is more or less where I'm going to draw the line. Like this is what I'm going to use to accelerate this. And then any, anything else is going to be things like CPU improvements. Um, playing with like the cache hierarchy. If there's even going to be a hierarchy, I think there's just going to be one, one cache level as far as I know. And in fact, the first implementation is probably going to only have an instruction cache and not a data cache. Um, because that, that is actually all you need for the common case to get uh, one instruction or one cycle per instruction. And we are talking about cycles per instruction, not instructions per cycle, because I'm not doing anything like multi-issue. But maybe if I end up adding some kind of floating support to the CPU, which I might do, which is also why I'm making a test bed that's going to handle more than just these multiply accumulates, um, then maybe that'll be a separate float pipe. And then maybe I'll, I'll want it when I get there, I'll want to do something clever with like dual issue or something. Who knows? Who knows? Because once you get to that stuff, then you start wanting to do things like align instructions because then you need to always be able to pull, you know, 64 bits. Essentially, you always want to be able to pull 32 bit uh, or two 32 bit instructions out of the instruction cache every cycle and then see if they can be piped. And if they can, then you want to put them through both pipes, like, for example, um, if that even makes sense. <laughs> I don't know. I, I find that stuff really fun to think about if you, can, if you couldn't tell already. Uh, so yeah, so if um, x bits is less than, let's do min uh, x bits is 2. So now these pass, but now these other ones failed. New exceeded storage bit with one and three, and it's probably that I yeah did something like two here, or actually that's this one. Yeah. Okay, let's put a two here and a thirty here. Let's do it that way, and then this stays the same. Oh yeah, and these also always have a sign bit. I think that's sensible. And then yeah, this doesn't work either. I need two here. Let's even do one, three, five. I'm just adjusting this so I don't have to change the exception, which isn't a big deal anyway. Exactly two curves. We'll never know. I actually, I, I've been thinking about uh, like different names because this is dot product engine right now, but I might actually call this something like Max like multiply accumulators because it is multiple of those. And then that actually goes really well with my CPU, which right now is called Marv for mostly adequate risk five. <laughs> so maybe there's a theme emerging here. We'll see. <laughs> maybe max. Who knows? I could even call it Mac, but I, I don't want to call it just Mac because I think like Mac or Mac is 
normally used to refer to this operation, and this makes it both plural and a unique name, so I think that's better. Hey, Wester Tube and Static. So I think maybe I'll call this max instead of DPE. That sounds fun. <laughs> but yeah, this is definitely the architecture that I want now after this. Yeah, no kidding, two curves. <laughs> Yeah, significant is, does zero make sense? Zero bits here. I feel like it might. <laughs> I feel like it actually might make sense. I'm gonna go with it and then if it's, if I'm wrong, then that's fine. So then actually, if that's legal, and these, since these are U32s, I actually don't need to add checks for that. So yeah. Okay. So that's that's more or less how the format's going to be and then then I want to be able to figure out values. So I think I'll do this. It's not get pushed, I wanted to run it. Great. Yeah, probably need to do create format as well. And I don't really care that this ends up being kind of verbose because we're going to end up with stuff like, I don't know. What? We're going to have stuff like let the is value. And I think I want to do this like from, from components, from comps. And you give it, uh, let's see. And that's another thing, actually. I might want to do uh, expose like functions on here where you could create some common ones. So like this, I think 823 is what you would use for IEEE singles. So anyway, to make a value, you'd specify these components. So you specify the sign bit, which would be 0, 1, or maybe I want that to be true or false because it's always going to be signed like that I'm not sure <coughs> and then one and then zero for example and actually if this is going to be treated as unsigned then this would like probably implicitly have the bias in it so you probably end up with something like this I think this is how you encode one Let's see, online floating points calculator. Or one of these. There's a few of these kind of tools that I think are really great for this kind of thing, where you have something like this. So in this case, yeah, I think I made negative one, right? Because it would be true. And then you'd take all of these for 127. And then this you'd have zero. Yeah, so that's negative one. That's great, Mem News. Yeah, I love these things. Of course, this only gives me floats and not halves, but I figure, like, I'll probably end up doing a lot of the testing in this because it's familiar anyway, like this uh, as IEEE singles. 
So yeah, so I might I might want to make a constructor for that, which then I should add tests for. Panic, fix me. Just to make sure that this test isn't committed. <laughs> Oh, that's cool, Memnus. That sounds fun. Yeah, and also for this format, you would do clone, um, which means I need to implement clone. By the way, I'm seeing more and more things like PlayStations and N64 projects that are targeting FPGAs. I think it's really cool. Unrelated. I mean, this is ultimately going to be more powerful hardware, actually. So, which is kind of fun to think about. Um, but yeah, I think those are really cool projects. But yeah, I mean, this is the same stuff, right? Sign, bool, exp, sig. So it's literally these plus some checks. <laughs> yeah, I think Mr.'s cool. I'm actually really bummed that I missed the pre-order for the pocket. fact I'm just <laughs> making sure I'm notified when it gets back in stock <laughs> I just filled in the form on the website right now I'm actually somewhat on the fence in Rust. When when you derive these traits, do you add tests for them or not? And I'm kind of on the fence. I think I think the right answer is actually yes, but in some cases you don't have to care <laughs> because it's possible to, at some point later in the project or whatever, um, it's possible to like change what clone means. I think that's unlikely for something like clone and copy, but you can do that and then you might define that as something different and then you want your test to fail. So yeah, who needs tests anyway? <laughs> I'll tell you what I do. Cause I'm guessing I'm going to end up messing up some details here. So I would like to have these covered in tests rather than in my head. Um, especially for corner cases, because I think, I think ultimately like, I don't, I don't even know if I talked about like how floating point addition and multiplication work. I mean, you guys probably already know a lot of this, but for example, multiplication, because you have this thing in like uh, exponential or scientific notation, you basically add the exponents and then multiply the significance. And before that, you might have to do things like de like detecting and propagating NAND information. After that, you might have to do things like renormalizing the results. And addition is kind of similar. Like you, you get everything shifted such that you have the same exponent for both numbers and then you then you add the significance and then like if that overflows you need to adjust the exponent and, and so on so like like all these operations are not terribly complicated but i feel like there's a lot of potential issues in all those little pieces like making sure that i can always detect nans properly i want like separate tests for that part um detecting the right overflows things like that so yeah exact things like sticky bits to get correct rounding like all this kind of stuff um i want tests for so that's why I'm doing tests. I think it's in personal projects. I don't like to do tests as much because they're boring. 
<clears throat> but there's some some places where it's just like that's the best tool in the toolbox. Um, uh, yeah, two curves. The pocket. It's a analog pocket. Let me pull it up. It was really dumb that I missed the pre-order, to be honest, because I was talking about it like days before. Um, it's an FPGA-based console by Analog that's meant to play um, essentially whatever game fits in the slot. So I think they support a few different systems. Uh, game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, uh, and then cartridge adapters for other ones like Game Boy or Game Gear, Neo Geo, Pocket Color, Atari Lynx, and more. Which is pretty cool. By the way, I do not agree with this at all. It is emulation, but it's uh, FPGA emulation, which is not necessarily better, in my opinion. Um, but regardless, it looks like a cool product. It looks like it's nice to hold, and it looks like it has relatively powerful FPGA, FPGAs in it. It's not that cheap. I think it's 200 bucks, but I'd be well willing to pay 200 bucks to have an FPGA hooked up to a screen and a battery, right? Like just looking at it from that perspective, it looks awesome. So I think Someday you might see the Xeno Wing on one of these screens. That I can say would be really cool. Um, I'm not super thrilled that the FPGA is an Altair FPGA or an Intel FPGA now. I would I would prefer it if it were Xilinx just because I like the tooling a little bit better at this point. But uh, I don't know. It's a pretty cool thing. Pretty cool. Yes, more efficient, I can totally agree with. I totally agree with potentially more efficient. <laughs> yeah, definitely, Madwoos. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> And actually about that efficiency thing, I actually wonder if that's the case because it's definitely like um, you're not going to waste as many clock cycles if you're doing an emulation on FPGA than if you were to do that on CPU. But given a sufficiently low power CPU and a sufficiently targeted implementation of an emulator on that CPU, I wonder if it's possible to get one of those that uses less power than, than like a relatively large FPGA. I wonder. So I, I would like to see that like measured at some point <laughs> because my gut feeling is that with like some really well-designed, really efficient CPU, that might actually be better. But you also have to take into account that you would, I think for that to be a fair comparison, you also need basically the same user experience. So that emulator, both emulators need to present themselves as the original system, like with full frame rate and everything, because that like to maintain the frame rate and the experience of interacting with the original system, I think is like necessary for it to be considered a fair comparison. Right. Yeah, exactly. Rush. I have like maybe a, a GBMU for a modern Cortex M zero or whatever, whatever the modern cores that they produce now in like a really power efficient format might actually be more efficient from an energy perspective than an FPGA that's large enough to fit that design with all the memory and everything. Again, I don't really know. Like, these are the things that I don't really have an intuition for. But I think it'd be interesting because I feel like I can come up with cases where it might actually be more efficient on CPU. Which, anyway, I think that's the interesting debate, actually, that that should people should be having about FPGA emulation versus CPU emulation. But that's not the one that they have. The one that they have is based on making things up, <laughs> I guess. <clears throat> like... It's basically proven in like the 40s that like any system can be implemented on any other system given sufficient like memory and, and cycles. And the fact that your compute medium is FPGA fabric versus a CPU doesn't really matter to me. When you get when you get logically the same system, right? And and again I'm assuming that both in both cases the emulator is good enough to accurately, like faithfully represent the original system from a logical level. Um, which I think is the lowest level you can go before it, before you're not talking about the same thing anymore. Yeah, exactly, Madmoose. And to be fair, like that's, <laughs> I know that that's what 
the analog site means when they say no emulation they mean like well actually not to be fair it makes me really annoyed because what they're trying to do is they're trying to essentially exploit that debate to sell a product that's basically more expensive um which they can do in the world because there's a lot of people that do believe that fpgas are better ways to emulate these things which my point is i don't think they necessarily are because that doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah exactly zmos how can i have bugs if it's on the fpga well if it doesn't represent the the hardware like if it doesn't behave the same if there's extra weight states because the memory was different for example then it's not even the same system <laughs> then you're, you've cut corners to make an emulator possible and in that sense, like a software emulator can actually be more accurate because you don't have to abide by the physical limits of the FPGA either. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir here. That's the point. But, like, I get really annoyed about that stuff. But, again, I want one of those analog pocket things not to play games, but to have this, like, all-in-one FPGA system. And I think that it's a good price for that assuming that it is high quality case and, and screen and everything, which it looks like it is. So I'm really excited that they came out with it. I just am annoyed by the marketing <laughs> and I kind of don't blame them because like it's a good strategy given the way that the arguments that you do see online. Um, and especially because they are selling like a premium product, like it's, it's not that cheap. Like you can get Chinese emulation consoles that are based on an arm core that again, run just fine and and have good emulators on them and are cheaper and might even be more power efficient but but i want the thing with the fpga and the screen <laughs> anyway <laughs> enough of that rant You know, even two frames of lag is a, fu is a funny thing to bring up because it's like, first of all, I, practically, I don't think that matters. You, I think you could decide that it matters, but you could also design, um, I mean, it may not be practical, but I think you can design a system that's still CPU based where the CPU is fast enough to match the output of the display for such a low resolution as you would need to emulate these old systems. And then you wouldn't have the lag. And I think the opposite can be true too, where you can have an FPGA system where the display controller might be on like a different clock or something and you have to buffer the output anyway. I don't know. I don't know. I come up with counter examples for days. I guess I guess that's the point. And again, I know you guys agree with this, but like they're both just different kinds of things that are good at different things, like a microcontroller versus an FPGA. And then the fact that you implement an emulator on on one or the other is not really the point, right? Yeah, whatever. I'm losing my train of thought a bit, but I know I'm right. <laughs> yeah, because what is, if you have all these as zeros, is that when you get NAN or is that when you get D-norms? Yeah, you get D-norms then. That's what it is. Except this one, right? Or, or is it all ones here that's NANs? I think that's what it is. Or is that inf? That's NAN. Because 
because I thought it was one of these that was quiet versus signal NANDs. Maybe this just isn't telling me that. These are things I need to look in the spec for, but I'm happy to just play with a tool like this a bit. All thinking about it. By the way, it's hot in here. <laughs> so I'm probably not going to stream too much longer today. But I'm happy I got to rant about all the designs here and everything again. I feel like the last few streams have mostly been that, just like talking about the designs. <laughs> but whatever. You know, let's see. So true, Memnus. What panicked it fixed me? That's exactly what I want to see. I think this is kind of cool if we do this. I think we can even do this. Cool to have tests about this. Yeah, also IEEE 754 is not actually a sufficient name, is it? it should be single. We might want like half or something. I mean, I guess I could do 80 bit too, right? That's kind of the nice part about this design, but I don't really see why I would. <laughs> Num X for num sig. That's nice, because then, then for most of the, like a lot of these tests, I can do this. So I think that's kind of nice. And then I think, because I have this from comps, and I think I'll also do like a function from bits, maybe. And I think I have, yeah, this back storage bits is 32. This is, I guess I would need to extend this if I wanted to do more than 32 bits, which it's arbitrary, but then this interface would also change. And maybe these would too. Um, So this would eventually return, you know, value from comps. Let 
man, it would it would decode this based on format. <clears throat> Next, do I have to do yet? Yeah, I do. Cool. I remember seeing the R, like, not RFC, but the landed pull request for that a long time ago. And then at some point I updated, now it's in my compiler. Um,. But yeah, so I, I imagine a lot of tests would basically look like this. Like you, you get a format and then you have A and B, which would either be from comps or from bits where you'd have like some hexadecimal value and then you would do some kind of op. So let's, I don't know, um, result is A plus B. And I don't know if I necessarily want to have plus or if I want to do something like add whatever and then A and B. And then you would do like assert equal res dot two bits and then fade babe or something. Something like that I think would be really cool. So I'm thinking to have a lot of tests for different ops that would basically look like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then I can do things like actually make those decisions like overflowing ad should produce this kind of NAN. And even then you could assert things like, does this value represent NAN? <laughs> you know, what, what's the payload of that nan things like that or the sign as well which i think is still counts in nan that's where i think i'm going with this so actually starting with also having a method here for like the bias probably makes sense um, maybe I'll add more of these. Maybe I won't because again, this is a playground that's ultimately going to support whatever I'm doing. Like I'm not looking to do a full implementation of anything. I'm just going to implement what I want and what makes sense, which right now is just this. So multiply and add and maybe make those fused. Maybe I'll even do tests for all for like those cases separately and do the fused one just to see, get a better idea of what it takes which is kind of the whole, the whole point here. One, get a better idea of how it takes, and then two, codify that understanding um, in actual Rust code, which should make the hardware translation or the translation from that to HDL like, or RTL relatively simple. Um, maybe. But yeah, I think I'll actually stop for today because I'm, I'm just kind of losing focus and interest right now. <laughs> so I think I'm just going to quit. And go watch TV or something. But uh, thanks guys for hanging out. And listening to my rants. And giving me feedback on this design. And shooting the shit. This is really fun. And I'm glad I'm doing this every week. I'm glad you guys can make it. And I'm glad you guys like this design as well. So yeah. I'll see you later. <laughs>